good morning, everybody. It's 9 a.m. and welcome to the uh, Solon Chamber of Commerce uh, State of the City update uh, with the city of Solon. Uh, we've got a bunch of people joining right now. We'll get started in, uh, you know, in just about one minute. So uh, welcome everybody who's just joining now. Uh, welcome to those who have heard this message seven times in the past 10 minutes, um, but we're glad you're here. Uh, and uh, you know, able to use this platform to uh, uh, connect folks uh, to hear uh, what's going on at the city. All right, we are officially going to get started. So welcome everybody uh, once again. Uh, we've got a, a full agenda here today. Uh, I'm Tom Bennett, President and CEO of the Solon Chamber. Uh, helping me out, uh, as always, is my co uh, one of my co-hosts, Kaylin Mills. Uh, and also uh, uh, helping out from a co-hosting standpoint uh, is Maria over at the city uh, and Jim Gims over at the city. Uh, so we, uh, we've done our tech check, um, you know, power goes out the city. We got the slide deck. If it goes out here, uh, we, you know, the, the city's got the slide deck. So, uh, but we're excited for our program, uh, and really excited to, uh, you know, welcome, uh, 50 plus people here for this, uh, for this update. So a uh, quick agenda update, um, we're going to hear from, uh, we'll, just a couple of quick updates from the Solon Chamber. Uh, and upcoming things that are happening. Uh, and then we're gonna turn it over to uh, the city of Solon to get updates uh, you know, from Jim, Matt, Angie, and uh, Mayor Krause. Uh, and during, you know, throughout the course of this presentation, um, you know, if you have questions that you would like asked, uh, please use uh, the chat function uh, and you can send that directly to me. Uh, and I will be compiling questions to ask, uh, you know, at the appropriate time. Uh, and this, uh, all the slides can be found if it's easier for you to follow along um, via the presentation, you know, while not on Zoom, uh, they can be found at solonchamber.com uh, slash slides. Uh, so being, uh, you know, we go from nothing to, uh, you know, to things in a week. So we've got uh, two things this week, this call um, and presentation this morning. Uh, and then tomorrow uh, night, we are uh, uh, bringing folks together in a very spread out form over at the Town Place Suites from 5 to 7 p.m. Uh, it is a pre-register only event uh, with a 50 person max. Uh, and there are uh, over 35 people RSVP. So if you have any intention, uh, we need that RSVP um, to ensure that we are doing all of the uh, uh, proper spacing. Uh, and there'll be several food trucks uh, there as well. Uh, our next uh, presentation uh, via Zoom uh, is going to be on uh, Wednesday, August 12th. Uh, and that's gonna be connecting schools and business uh, and what roles they play in reopening uh, safely because we know that the uh, you know individual industries and sectors uh, are doing uh, what they need to do to reopen safely, but how our businesses and schools working together um, because they're so intertwined. Um, so we're really excited to have uh, Solon Board Education uh, and Nestle uh, present their perspectives uh, on that. So that uh, more information you know, is on our website uh, for that. Uh, our golf outing, uh, we're above 70 registrations so far. And we're capping it at 90. So that means there's five foursomes left. So if you have any intention of playing golf, uh, with us on August 31st, that's Signature Soul and Country Club. Uh, we expect that to be sold out uh, by the end of uh, July. So uh, if interested, let us know, uh, get your sign up uh, because we, we fully expect that to be sold out uh, very quickly. <clears throat> so for those of you that know that I love to talk, um, I am gonna give up my six minutes um, at 9.04. That does not mean the mayor gets an extra six minutes. Um, that's for Angie and Jim and Matt, uh, but I'm gonna turn it over uh, and Jim Gibbs at the city is going to uh, take over uh, the slide deck uh, and so forth. 
Uh, and thank you and welcome everybody for, uh, for welcome and thank you for, for joining us. And we're gonna, uh, I will be quiet. Okay, can I start? All right, so um, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you to our uh, partners, Tom and Kaylin for having us here. Uh, quick nod to um, uh, the hat and, and the uh, coat. Uh, just uh, uh, a reference to um, our good friend uh, Samuel Bull, uh, the, the founder of our community. Uh, it was just a few short months ago, I think it felt like a few years ago now, uh, that we were at Signature doing our um, State of the City uh, pre-COVID, and uh, it feels like a long time away, but I just thought I'd put the, put the hat and coat on just as a nod to, um, uh, to, to Samuel Bull. Uh, what I wanted to do today, really, uh, first off, um, want to hopefully do something that uh, I've probably never done in my life, uh, be uh, brief uh, and be to the point. Um, that's one thing I want to accomplish today. And the, my second uh, thing that I want to accomplish, uh, unlike um, you know me talking just at the uh, state of the city, uh, really today I want it to be about um, the team. Uh, I, I've, uh, we, we've assembled... Um, the best team I've ever seen here in our community. I've been, it's my 19th year uh, as an elected official uh, in the city of Solon, and I, I really can't remember uh, a time where we've had uh, such a great professional uh, group of directors, employees, and so I wanna really highlight um, the work they do because um, as you all know, all too well, I'm just the pretty face. Uh, they're the ones that make everything happen, deliver the services, uh, save lives, uh, bring in business, uh, clean our water, take care of our seniors. Uh, everything that we do, it's all about my directors and, and my team. So um, with that being said, uh, I think um, when I talk about the state of the city, uh, I think there's probably three things that, that we'll sort of highlight today. Um, staying healthy, uh, staying connected, uh, and staying safe. Um, sort of everything we did from uh, mid-March uh, all started with uh, the health and safety of the community, as you probably are well aware. Uh, we shut down uh, pretty quick all of our buildings. Uh, we closed all of the events. Uh, unfortunately, we had to cancel the, uh, the bicentennial uh, home days, all the things that um, we love here in our community. Uh, part of, you know, the pop-up in the park, uh, the fall fest, uh, all the movies in the park, um, all the various things. And so uh, we did it um, because we wanted to make sure that everyone was, was safe and was healthy. Uh, and that's guided us. Um, we've been very fortunate here in our community with the low amount of uh, uh, COVID uh, in Solon. Uh, and I think that's because people here had a lot of common sense. Uh, we listened to um, the CDC. We listened to uh, the state health director, Amy Acton. Uh, we spoke um, regularly, if not daily, with uh, the Cuyahoga County Board of Health. Uh, and we actually have a medical uh, director, Don Spanner, with uh, University Hospitals that guides us. Um, and so everything we did was guided by uh, science, uh, data, uh, medical experts, our physicians. Uh, and we actually have a, a good friend, um, uh, Frank Esper here, who's uh, one of the leading world experts in infectious disease. And he happens to be a good friend. Uh, he was my former neighbor. Now he lives in Ward 3. Uh, but Frank helped us a great deal uh, guiding us through this. So, um, so, so we, we stayed safe, we stayed healthy, we stayed at home, uh, we distanced. And as we started to reopen, uh, besides staying healthy, one of the things that was critical for all of us um, was to stay connected. And uh, the three people um, that I just really want to highlight today with staying connected are uh, Jill Frankel, uh, the greatest uh, senior director probably in the country. Uh, you will never find uh, a senior services, a senior department, uh, anything um, like Solon. Sometimes I don't even like to go to the Mayors and Managers Association meetings because when the topic of senior services comes up, uh, people just say, well, why don't we ask Solon? Uh, why don't we talk about what Solon's doing? Because if Solon's doing it, uh, that means that uh, the rest of the uh, area, the rest of the Northeastern Ohio and the state have to do it. So first I wanna highlight what Jill did and you, you see a slide there uh, and it's truly uh, remarkable um, how Jill and her team uh, have virtually connected with you know, all of our seniors. And I just wanna highlight a couple things in there. Um, 
6,623 virtual program engagements um, since uh, COVID. 2,100 hours of virtual programming uh, that were viewed. Over 100 uh, volunteers. Uh, 8,400 uh, local adults, uh, senior adults, uh, that were contacted for uh, outreach. Uh, 5,000 uh, personal protective uh, equipment items that were donated. Uh, 749 mobile pantry participants. Uh, 885 uh, delivered uh, food uh, deliveries uh, through our um, programs, through our volunteers. Uh, look at the uh, amount of uh, uh, Facebook uh, action that we have now at our senior center. 187% uh, Facebook engaged users, 240% uh, uh, Facebook page uh, consumption uh, that it's up. The nutritional support for all of the people in our community that needed it, uh, the boxes, the groceries, the prepared food, uh, the mobile food pantry, um, it's been truly amazing. Uh, it's uh, really a, a testament to Jill and her team, uh, the love and support and, and the connected. Uh, I do the um, Coffee with Kraus, we just did one the other day. Uh, and it was so important that we uh, continue to connect with our seniors. Uh, during these difficult times of a pandemic, uh, many are shut at home, uh, they're isolated. Um, there's a lot of issues that go on when uh, sometimes you live alone. Uh, you need that phone call and Jill and her team just did such a great job of uh, making that uh, happen. So I wanna thank Jill and uh, everybody else that serves in our senior community. We just had a, uh, our food pantry yesterday at Resurrection Church. We probably served over 100 families that the uh, Jill, her team, and our great Rotary Club uh, gets involved in uh, feeds uh, the city of Solon and those that need it the most. So uh, thank you, Jill. Uh, next, uh, I wanted to highlight our uh, great staff at Solon Rec. Uh, amazing timing that uh, my good friend Don Holub had uh, to retire uh, just as the pandemic was hitting. Uh, and uh, Donnie knows exactly when to uh, make that graceful exit. But uh, uh, out uh, went Donnie uh, and in came uh, a truly great inspirational leader, uh, our director, Rich Parker. Uh, Rich took over during the pand pandemic, uh, never missed a beat, um, was with us when we had to shut everything down and then was so excited uh, to reopen, uh, reopen uh, our soul and rec, but in a very safe way, uh, in a very modified way. Uh, our rec center is open uh, just for uh, exercising equipment. Uh, we've put uh, equipment in the gym so that it's safe and it's spaced out. We still have equipment on the mezzanine. We do not use uh, the rest of the rec center uh, except for the indoor pool. Uh, there are three lap lanes and three areas for uh, water exercise and you have to make a reservation and it's only uh, 45 minutes. When we reopened the rec center, uh, I was shocked at how clean it was. We've, we've uh, uh, I think a rec center has been open 17, about 17 years. Uh, I don't think it's ever looked uh, better and cleaner. And thanks to the great job that Rich and his staff have done, Rich Conklin and Coach and everybody uh, at the rec center. Uh, our community park is open. Uh, as you're probably aware, we have a lot of travel uh, baseball teams. My son plays in the Twinsburg baseball team. Uh, a lot of signage up at the community park, um, both in terms of uh, what the players have to do, what the coaches have to do in terms of masks and, and distancing. Uh, our playground is open, getting a lot of use, and we have to make sure uh, that the, our, our youngsters are using it uh, in, a, in a safe way. Uh, tennis courts, probably more uh, play on our tennis courts than I've ever seen. A uh, lot of good signage. We have some people there that are monitoring the court so that everything is done uh, safely. Uh, we have set times for pickleball so that people can enjoy uh, uh, pickleball. Uh, we've had the opportunity, unlike other communities, to be able to open a pool. Uh, and it's really worked out wonderfully. While the, the outdoor pool that our rec center is closed, uh, just because it's more of a special use facility, uh, the Arthur Road pool, the municipal pool, has been open uh, pretty much for over a month. Uh, it's open five days a week. Uh, it's regularly cleaned. You have to bring your own chair. So the pool deck is wide open so you can distance. Uh, you have to wear a mask in. Uh, you have to register. We only allow a certain amount of people uh, on at the pool at a, at a given time. And it's really given uh, Solon an opportunity to, to swim, uh, to use the lap lanes, to be able to get in the water and exercise, uh, do it safely. Uh, we have a lot of folks that use the water exercises in the morning, uh, the Solon Stars practice. So very excited to have uh, the Solon uh, Municipal Pool open. Grantwood has been open uh, for the last four months. Probably a lot of people on this call 
uh, are using Grantwood. So I'm really, really happy to be able to have our golf, our golf course open uh, and everyone using it uh, safely with distancing and with a lot of cleaning. Uh, over a month ago, we opened our dog park at Timberlake Park. Uh, please, if you have a dog, uh, use it. It's really an awesome uh, dog park uh, for the community. Uh, make sure your dog is friendly uh, and, uh, and go and, and use it and really uh, take in the beauty uh, that we have at uh, Timberlake Park. We've had a lot of classes at home. Rich has provided uh, all of the virtual classes uh, that we've had in our community. So I want to thank to Rich and his team for uh, slowly and safely uh, and with the health of the community, um, giving our residents the opportunity to have uh, some semblance of a uh, summer uh, with soul and recreation. So thanks, Rich. Uh, next, I want to go to uh, Tracy. Uh, Tracy, again, came in uh, right, right around the pandemic started as our new director of the Solon Center for the Arts. Uh, Tracy's done an amazing job of uh, continuing with virtual classes and dance and theater and art and music. We've had camps. Uh, that have opened up. You've probably seen the uh, uh, summer uh, art camps. They, they have them in the parking lot. They're socially distanced. We have a camp at um, the dance center. Uh, we also have a recreation camp. Uh, so we really uh, operated with enhanced cleaning. We have drop-off procedures. Uh, the art center, uh, while it's uh, virtually open, um, uh, it's closed, but we're doing a lot of uh, cleaning in there. We're doing a movie in the park. Uh, tied that in the parks. So I want to thank Tracy for continuing to uh, operate, uh, continuing to provide all the great arts and culture uh, that our community has become accustomed to uh, in, uh, in the community. So thank you, Tracy. Uh, and that really uh, ties into um, uh, from the connectedness that uh, Tracy and Jill and Rich have done, keeping our community connected to the arts and rec and, and our senior services uh, really uh, ties into um, how we have been able to uh, stay safe. Uh, and I couldn't thank um, our safety forces uh, enough, uh, our first responders. Um, they are the, the heart and soul uh, of our community. Uh, again, uh, new, new people, uh, new directors, new chiefs that have um, come in, stepped in, provide us with uh, the greatest sense of leadership. Um, first, I wanna highlight uh, Chief Rick Tonelli. Uh, Rick is, he's the man, uh, an amazing police chief, has been around Solon for uh, 29 years, uh, less than a year as um, police chief. Uh, and I just want to highlight a couple things, uh, the, tell you a little bit about uh, Rick Tonelli. Uh, the first week, week that uh, Rick Tonelli became police chief, uh, Rick and I met with um, a, a very uh, a great group in our community, the Black Family Alliance. Uh, it's a group of black families that have been meeting here for a long time. And even before what the tragic tragedy, what happened with uh, George Floyd, uh, Rick engaged with uh, the African American families in our community uh, to make sure that they understood some of the issues with the police department, and the police department understood the concerns of our uh, African American brothers and sisters. And we've continued that uh, through um, even through the uh, when we had our uh, prayer vigil uh, just a little over a month ago. Uh, and uh, the police officers, uh, they weren't there to confront everybody. Actually, the police officers were there to participate uh, in the interfaith uh, prayer vigil that was organized by uh, the Chagrin Valley Islamic Center. And it's a testament to Rick Tonelli uh, that our police department is part of the community. Uh, they work with the community. They provide community policing. They uh, go up and down our neighborhoods. They meet with uh, area businesses. Um, they've had uh, so much of um, the community uh, night out uh, that we do, uh, which is attended by uh, the community. Uh, and then we bring the community in. Uh, we've had virtual uh, programming uh, where uh, residents participate in classes with our police departments. Uh, and through this police academy, we've had over 400 citizens that have participated with our police department. So uh, I wanna thank Rick and, and his team, the best police department uh, uh, in uh, Northeastern Ohio. Uh, and just lastly, to show you what kind of a police department we have. Um, one, one of the, when we were on the march with the students that Sunday afternoon, uh, and instead of um, uh, what, what the police department does, they actually engage with the students. And a couple of the students, high school students came up to me and said, wow, Mayor, um, what a great police department you have. Um, they were high-fiving us, they were talking to us, they were engaging with us. And it just uh, sends the message that uh, the police department is part of the community. Uh, they're part of the solution. They wanna help with everything that we do in our community. 
Uh, and they actually have a, a safe passage program where uh, those that are opioid addicted can be able to come to the police department uh, for help and, and, and not get arrested. So uh, very cutting edge, a lot of things we do. Uh, I wanna thank um, Mark Vetter, uh, who is our new fire chief, uh, but uh, Mark served uh, for 34 years uh, with the city of Solon. Um, the, the fire department uh, is the, uh, they're on the front lines of treating people with COVID uh, they've been able to um, do that with full uh, equipment. Uh, they, when they have to go to a, a home with COVID, uh, not only do they have to treat the patient, they have to keep themselves uh, safe. And so they go with the full equipment. Um, they do it. Uh, they've been doing it amazingly through, through COVID. Uh, the calls have actually started to come up a little bit because uh, now that the hospitals are, are opening up a little bit, we've been doing more with obviously people with strokes and heart attacks and various other things. So I wanna, I wanna thank Chief Better. I'm gonna thank his team uh, with the fire department. Um, there probably wasn't a day where someone in the community, whether a business uh, or, or a resident didn't drop off uh, protective equipment to our fire department and they were able to distribute it uh, to all the departments. So, um, it's, so it's such a blessing having uh, the expertise of uh, Mark Vetter and, and his team uh, to help us uh, on the front lines with uh, saving lives uh, and that's what our fire department does uh, every day. So thank you to both of the chiefs. Um, another part of our uh, frontline workers are, uh, this, are the um, service department. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Director Mark Hawley. Mark is also new, uh, but he has uh, a great mentor in Bill Dersick, our public works uh, commissioner. Uh, some of the things that they've had to do a little bit differently, uh, we've added new drop-off procedures for uh, larger uh, items. Uh, the service department assisted with the city's award of the 40th year of Tree City uh, USA. The service department also has to make sure that they were safe in picking up all their equipment, uh, picking up trash, picking up the brush. Uh, not only um, were they able to do this through COVID, but we also had some severe flooding, uh, particularly in probably Ward 3, uh, Ward 2. So they were able to, um, uh, through COVID, uh, handle all the flooding issues, make sure uh, the brush and, and everything was picked up. So uh, all the inflow and infiltration. So I want to thank our great service department under Mark's leadership, being able to continue to provide uh, exemplary services uh, to, our, to our community. So uh, thank you to our service department. Uh, next, um, next slide. And uh, through all of this, uh, as you're probably aware, we're a community that does a lot of construction projects, uh, even through COVID. Uh, we've been able to do many, many different uh, construction projects. Last year, uh, obviously, was a banner year. We spent $24 million in construction. Uh, a lot of you remember the uh, SOM uh, interchange, uh, the pretty rough construction project there, uh, the SOM Road uh, project, um, Arborddale, I could go on and on. Uh, even this year, uh, through COVID, we've been able to do a lot of very significant uh, reconstruction projects. Obviously, a Water Wreck had the aerial project, um, Creekside Trail, uh, the Valley Forge stream that we're looking at, uh, the Solon Road reconstruction with Swage Lock, uh, Cochran Road resurfacing, Miles Road culvert, the, the retaining wall, uh, Briar Hill Bridge. Uh, so I really want to thank um, John Bush, a great city engineer, for providing um, all of these uh, road construction projects. And we continue to do our, our annual, all of our annual projects, you know, the concrete, the asphalt, the street, sanitary, uh, preventative maintenance, the grouting, the basin. Uh, fire hydrant painting and all of our traffic signal pole painting. So um, testament to uh, the great engineering services that we uh, provide uh, for our community. So uh, thank you, John. Um, go to the next slide. And, and Paul continues to do a great job at our uh, water rec. You don't hear a lot water, about water rec, but they provide such an essential service, uh, making sure our, our water is clean, that it's flowing clean. They provide uh, really help with a lot of the flooding issues that we had. Uh, they've been instrumental uh, making sure that all of the water procedures are followed through COVID. They work a lot with the EPA and, and the county, and they provide a lot of great services. Um, that's what provides all the water services to our businesses, uh, to the 900 and so uh, businesses we have in our community. And thanks to Paul and all of the folks at uh, Water Rec for um, toughing it out, uh, making sure that um, they provide all these great services, uh, even through uh, the pandemic we're having. So uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, Rob uh, Franklin uh, and his team, um, it's been amazing how uh, we've been able to operate so successfully uh, even through a pandemic. So sometimes I think we're doing better now 
uh, even just through the short uh, pandemic period with the Rob Franklin and his team working through home, 800 permits uh, have been through the pandemic, uh, 30 million um, in construction uh, that's, that's uh, gone on. And uh, I really wanna thank Rob and uh, the permitting process um, through the work uh, Jim Gibbs has done through IT has been uh, tremendous. Um, they've been able to do this seemingly. They haven't uh, missed a beat. Last planning commission, I think we had nine items uh, on our agenda. So um, we're still doing a lot of work, residential, uh, com commercial, uh, the industrial areas, um, many things uh, are happening. A lot of different construction projects are going on. You're, you're aware in the industrial area with um, Swage Lock and, and Brennan Industries, but got a, two, a couple new um, doctors, dentist offices going up uh, right next to uh, Walgreens, uh, right next to uh, the Giant Eagle uh, Market District. Um, we just approved uh, Panera uh, drive through the other night. Um, and the one thing I, I wanted to mention, um, just to, to make it clear uh, how much culture has shifted uh, in our community that um, uh, the, the Panera drive through the other night um, it would not have been imaginable years ago uh, to have it so seamless. Um, even uh, Art Lawrence and Daryl Young, the owners of the plaza said they can't believe how easy it was uh, with the city of Solon. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with Rob Franklin and Angie Shaker uh, being so business friendly and uh, a great business friendly council. I know a lot of my colleagues are, are on this call uh, I want to thank them for uh, really providing that culture of making it easy to do business in our community. Uh, it wasn't like this years ago, uh, for those of you on the call that remember uh, the tough days of anyone that tried to bring a business, um, enhance a business, bring a restaurant, anything to the community. Most of the time they got shot down and then they went elsewhere. But now uh, they're able to do it easily in Solon. And so I want to thank our team for making it easy to do business uh, in our community. So. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Angie, for that, especially. Um, lastly, uh, I wanna end, uh, and um, with everything that we're doing, um, one of the most important that, things that we can do as a community, uh, besides uh, connecting and, and be, be, being business friendly, is uh, working with uh, the Cuyahoga County Planning Commission on Soul and Connects. Um, one of the things that when we do surveys in our community, um, and the Cuyahoga County Plan Planning Commission has done the survey, the most important thing that residents want, uh, they want a, a walkable, uh, connected uh, community. They want to be able to leave their home, get on their bike, take a walk, uh, put their baby in the stroller, uh, and being able to get to the Metro Parks, get to Hawthorne Parkway, uh, get to South Chagrin Reservation, uh, be able to get to Mitchell's, um, get to Panera, hopefully get to the new uh, developed Liberty Ford site, um, be able to get to yours truly, get to Chick-fil-A, you know, walk and bike to all these. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at, taking the 21 square miles of our community and making sure that um, wherever you go, uh, you're gonna be able to, to walk and bike and run uh, safely. Uh, we're looking at um, bike lanes, we're looking at uh, enhanced um, sidewalks, uh, we're looking at uh, road diets, uh, we're looking at a lot of different um, access to trails in our community, not just the Chagrin Falls Solon Trail and the uh, Norfolk Southern Trail, but being able to connect all these trails um, to all the beautiful Metro Parks area uh, in our community. So I really want to thank the County Planning Commission for doing this. Uh, we're going to have a Teletown Hall uh, in the fall, uh, providing uh, the opportunity to, to show people uh, how important it is because it's a quality of life issue. Uh, if we're able to do this, make sure that um, people can walk and bike safely uh, in our community. Um, that's why people want to move here besides our, our great Solon schools. Uh, that's why businesses want to locate here, here because uh, at lunchtime, their, res their um, employees would be able to walk safely. If you ever try to do that now uh, on Solon Road or some, sometimes in the industrial area, uh, it's very unsafe. So um, that's how uh, Solon Connects is so important for the future of our community. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to stop and uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, our great team. Am I up? You're up, man. Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, the slide you have, the challenge for me was to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, do a financial outlook in one slide. So that's what I've done. And the slide is, may seem a bit deceiving at first. No, it's not missing leader lines and it's not missing labels. What I wanted to do is just give the group a brief overview of City of Solon finances right now. So 
what we're currently looking at, what our challenges are, and where we're going in 2021. So I'm going to do that through these percentages. And these percentages all have meaning, and I'll, so I'll walk you through a brief story using these percentages as um, guidelines for where we're at. And, it, and believe me, it's, it's better than the alternative. I could give you one of my long and drawn-out PowerPoint presentations that I usually um, hit up the Finance Committee with, but I won't do that here. I'll stick with this one slide and give you a feel and some context for where we're at. So I'll start from the top and, and work my way down. The, the, uh, the pie chart actually is accurate. It, I know it doesn't have labels, but this is um, a correct representation of our general fund resources. And the big blue uh, piece of the pie is 80%, uh, represents 80% of our revenue. And as you probably under, um, could guess, income tax is the uh, bread and butter for Solon's operating resources. 80% of our income for general fund operations is derived from income tax collections. And that 80% actually has two meanings. The, it's 80% of our general fund revenues from income tax collections. And of that income tax collection, 80% is withholding. So it's the, the taxes employers are paying on their, on their employees' payroll uh, makes up 80% of our total in income tax collection. So it's a very important source of revenue for the city and for pretty much all cities in Ohio, as, you, as you're probably aware. Continuing down, so we, we, we know there's a downturn um, brought on by the, the COVID-19 pandemic and we've seen um, our revenue sources slip because of the economic slowdown. And right now, income tax collections are tracking at about a 7.6% drop from last year. So we're on a net basis, so income tax collections, net of refunds, we're down about 7.6% compared to 19. <clears throat> That's concerning enough. It's also concerning because 19, we have, we have a little bit of a down year in collection. We were down about three or 4%. So we're actually off from an off year. <clears throat> so making it more of a challenge. As far as income tax collections compared to our original target, we're down over 10%, 10.2% off our target. Now, the important caveat is because the filing date was, put, was pushed back three months, we're still waiting for deferred income to show up. So now that we've had our actual filing date passed, we're going to see how much income was deferred and how much was actually reduced. So I expect that 10.2% um, deficit from our target to improve somewhat. And we'll know through August and September what that looks like. So you can see that 80% chunk of revenue has taken a hit because of the downturn. One thing which what is inter interesting you know, each city has, a, has its own composition of income taxpayers, especially on the withholding side. And that's, of course, the most important side. Uh, what we have found, and it's a good surprise, is it appears right now our withholding um, income coming in from all the various employers in Solon has remained somewhat resilient. We're actually stable. We're fairly close to where we expected to be when we designed the revenue estimates for 2020, even with all the various disruptions in the economy and the unemployment and other things. So right now, at least for Solon, it's not the same for all cities, but for Solon, uh, we have seen um, those withholding numbers keep pace with what we expected despite all the problems in the regional and greater economy. So that's, that's at least in the near term. We'll see what happens through the rest of this year and into next year, and I will, I'll speak to next year as we keep moving down the line. Okay, so we had to react. Like most cities, we knew we we're gonna be looking at a revenue loss of potentially six or seven million out of about 45 million. So we had to react and we did that by asking departments to make targeted reductions to their operating budgets. So we didn't, the mayor didn't ask for a percentage cut. Um, we didn't look for um, specific targets. We asked directors to provide us areas where they could reduce the budget for this year, to hold down operating expenditures, to try to get somewhat into line with our new expected revenue picture for 2020. The one, thing that aided us and aids other cities is because of the slowdown in city operations, namely facilities were closed and there were various programs that were not being um, held. Um, there was a lot of natural reductions that could be attained. So departments were able to really, in a sense, grab onto those natural reductions, quantify them, and then inc incorporate those into the reduction plans. And that's what they did. Uh, we were able to garner about 6.6% .6 reduction in budget for the general fund, so about 2.7, 2.8 million in uh, reductions to operating budgets. And we, we refer to these as primary cuts. This is a term used by the Government Finance Officers Association. So these are short-term in nature, and they're, they're typically not um, harmful to ongoing programming or delivery of services. So we're able to achieve a 6.6% .6 cut for this year 
and for the most part, not erode any service levels or program offerings that we're able to put on uh, due to a lot of the restrictions um, because of the pandemic. So that 6.6% in cuts to the general fund equates real, roughly to offsetting our revenue loss by about 45%. So that means we didn't come to departments and say, hey, we're looking at a potentially $6 million revenue loss. We need $6 million in cuts. It's not what the, what the, um, the objective was. It was to see how much we could offset that revenue loss and then fall back carefully on our cash reserves to cover operating expenses for the rest of this year or what you may um, term operating margin. So that's, that's what we did this year. If the revenue outlook improves this year, that 6.6% in cuts will actually cover more than 45% of the revenue loss if you think about the, the basic math behind it. So that's where we're at right now. We, we actually formalized those cuts by amending the operating budget for this year. We also made some cuts to the capital project side, namely by deferring projects. There were several projects on the infrastructure side that have been deferred until next year or beyond. And we also deferred projects related to some facility improvements and uh, for the most part maintained most of our uh, planned equipment purchases for 2020. And there's some technical reasons why we did that. The way we, we generally use PAYGO to accomplish most of our CIP, our CapEx for the year, meaning we're using cash from the general fund um, for our general capital to get most of those projects funded in any given um, year of the capital improvement plan. Infrastructure, of course, is funded namely by a portion of income tax collections and federal highway dollars for the most part. So 2021 is gonna be a challenge. I think everyone agrees one of the key words or concepts for next year is gonna be uncertainty. Uh, we're not quite clear where the economy is heading. We know we've seen some rebound, um, although it's been modest. And the question is how sustainable is that rebound? If you, if you um, are a follower of any of the reporting that the Federal Reserve puts out, the quarterly beige book was released last week. And the beige book just gives a general economic um, review or overview of the, in, the individual um, Federal Reserve regions in the country. And for the most part, the reports were similar, that the various areas of the, the regional economies had seen some recovery, but there are doubts when they look, they, this report is based off information from various contacts within different industry sectors. And you know, for the most part, these industry sectors are concerned about the, the ability or the legs behind any type of recovery. And there is consensus that that recovery will be hampered by additional spikes in the virus, which we are seeing. So that translates directly to the city, because remember back to the 80% of the 80% of the revenue is from withholding. So we need uh, the ability to see some sustained growth, not just in, in Solon, but across the, the country and globally, because we know that um, a lot of Solon uh, companies uh, compete and work in a global marketplace. So it's gonna be important to continue seeing um, recovery, sustained recovery nationally and globally, because we know from, from the city standpoint that will have an impact on our main revenue source going into next year and beyond. So we're gonna be getting into budget development very shortly at the end of, end of July, early August. I'm gonna start working uh, with city departments on developing parameters and a set of guidelines on how we're going to approach budget development for next year. So I'm getting down to the, the 60 slash 65%. 60% of our operating budget is allocated towards our core services, public safety and public works, so the service areas and maintaining roadways. So 60% of our general fund um, is for those purposes. So we want to preserve those service levels. And we're gonna be doing that with uncertain revenue sources. And that 60% is achieved by people. 65% of our general budget is related to personnel costs, people. So we have to be mindful of how we're going to accomplish operating next year, knowing that we could have some uh, uncertainty in our ongoing revenue. So down to the last three, uh, the 4% and the 0% are related. Right now, if we look at our forecast to really to, to grow our way out of, uh, out, of the, um, out of the downturn, it's going to be very helpful if we can see about, I have 4%, but it's more like 3.5% revenue growth for the next two to three years. That's what we're hoping to see in a minimum to help us grow out of this, this downturn. And for the next two or three years, we're gonna be looking at flat budget, 0%. We're gonna to have to find a way to continue delivering, not just those 60% of core services, but all the programming and the important things the city accomplishes um, out of its general operations. How do we accomplish that with really trying to maintain a flat general operating budget? So we're gonna to have to be innovative to accomplish this. We're gonna to have to 
realize more efficiency gains, we will use the budget process to actualize those, but it's really gonna be the hard work of the, the, all of the directors, department heads working with the mayor and council to provide alternatives and options to see if we can may, remain close to that, that flat operating um, expenditure line. Now, if things tick up better than expected, we'll have some ability to grow a little bit on the operating side, but it's, it's going to be um, a cautious path forward for next year and into the next two or three years. Last number, 25%, you know, the adage is, it's true in, in the private sector, certainly, and even in the public sector, cash is king. So we have a policy to maintain at least a 25% uh, reserve balance in our general fund, 25% as compared to our operating budget. Um, right now we're, we're above that, we're in the um, high 40s. So we, we wanna be able to maintain not going be, uh, below that threshold in, into the next future years. So the things we do, moderating operating costs, if we can find additional revenue enhancement, and hopefully if we see that at least three to 4% revenue gro growth over the next two to three years, we'll be able to not just maintain, but exceed our, our, our cash backstop, if you will, of at least 25, hopefully closer to 50% for the foreseeable future. We do utilize our cash reserve. We will use it this year, possibly a little bit next year and beyond, but we're gonna measure that out very carefully. We understand that we are able to offset a portion of our projected revenue loss, and we are utilizing cash reserve this year and into next year, that's going to help us. But again, it's gonna be very measured and very cautious as we go forward. So that's um, our a brief outlook by the numbers, by the percentages. I hope it was enlightening and I'll take questions when we get to uh, the question and answer period. Thank you. All right, thank you, Finance Director Matt Rubino. When I saw that one slide, I looked at it without the, the labels and thought, mm, I have no idea what that means. So thank you for clearly explaining that and taking us through it. Um, and as you know, Matt indicated, of course, our main source of revenue is income tax collections. And you know, that comes from the business community. That comes from the, the jobs. They are supporting us. Um, and allowing us to provide those superior um, city services that the mayor so eloquently discussed. Um, so, you know, we've been, the one big thing that has come from this uh, pandemic is just the outpouring of support for our business community um, and from our business community to the senior center, to, um, to our residents. Uh, but, you know, some of the things that we have done here at the city and also the Chamber of Commerce, we've been, you know, just really great partners. I'm so appreciative of Tom and Kaylin and the Chamber Board and, and, and all of the members um, for, for supporting the Passport to Solon campaign. Uh, it kicked off. We, we were, you know, thinking about not doing it, but we, we decided to do it anyway. So I hope you pick it up, your, your passport. There's 28 businesses participating. It runs through November 30th. It's just a way to keep promoting our businesses and increase that foot traffic and just remind people that to support soul and businesses. I know it's so easy, especially right now when people are, are concerned, you know, they're scared. Um, and it's so easy to just go to Amazon and have everything shipped to you the very next day. Um, but when you do go um, into our businesses and spend money, it, it certainly helps protect the jobs and and our, our city services. So, um, you know, pick up your passport if you haven't done it. Um, we're also, you know, we've been receiving calls about, well, from businesses who aren't in the Passport to Solon uh, campaign and they're like, well, you know, can you help us too? So we're also doing business spotlights um, to highlight gems throughout the city. Uh, Miles Market was one of them, White Flower Cake Shop. So um, we've been promoting them through our social media channels as well. So, you know, keep your eye out, like, share those posts. That always helps. Um, another thing through this pandemic that has just been, I think, really helpful is, um, you know, we put up a, a COVID-19 Business Resource Center to help people know who to contact when they need help, when they're looking for grants, when they're looking for PPE. Uh, the Chamber, you know, still has a, a great resource on, on their website and they continue to update it regularly as well. And of course, the Solon Chamber Weekly Zooms, I know many of you have been on them, but, uh, you know, Tom and Kaylin have been uh, doing a great job and the members 
from our businesses talking about, you know, some of the lessons that they've learned, where they're getting PPE, um, and just, just how they're going about um, all the changes to, again, improve consumer confidence and safety and, and keep our businesses open. Um, and, you know, another thing that we've always heard about is, um, is in terms of workforce getting our talent here. Solon is the second largest job hub in Cuyahoga County, just behind Cleveland. Of course, Cleveland's number one, but, you know, I'm not sure if everybody knows that Solon is the second largest. So we employ a lot of people. Um, so, um, you know, one of the things they said is, you know, for folks who don't have a car, it's difficult for them to get here and for us to uh, keep the people here um, because it could take, you know, it takes over 60 minutes to get here. And then when they get, you know, if they're dropped off by RTA, it takes, you know, another, it could take 15 to 30 minutes to, to get to their business from there. Um, so we're, we have a, so we have formed a Solon Mobility Task Force. There's members of the business community that are on it. We've got our state and regional partners on this. We've got the Greater Cleveland RTA. We have a survey out in the field now. We're, we're working on collecting more data to start to come up with some solutions to solve this problem. You know, Nestle is a part of this group and, and they, they're working three ships they're working around the clock to provide food for America. They've been super busy, um, you know, because of COVID and more people staying home and eating frozen food and, you know, the foods that they prepare. Um, so again, transportation is an issue. So we're working on that. Um, going to the next slide. We have, um, you know, even with now last year was super, you know, it was a banner year. We had 47 new businesses open in Solon in 2019. Obviously, you know, we're not even close to that, but we're still getting, even in this time, we're still getting new businesses open. So please, you know, support these businesses. Um, I'm super excited. I can't wait till Hibachi Japan opens. That should be any day now. Um, you know, so, so um, you know, it's people know, people still want to open businesses in Solon. I'm still getting calls every day. Our vacancy rate, I did go through that. Our overall vacancy in retail, industrial, and office is 3% higher from January of 2019 to, or I'm sorry, July of 2019 to July of 2020. And that's, you know, not the greatest sign, but, you know, we do typically have 2% shifts either way on any given year. Um, so I think if you go to the next slide, you'll see that, um, you know, the, the good news is, is people see what's going on in Solon. And, you know, the C Cleveland Magazine just rated Solon the number one suburb of Cleveland you know, we, it's because of our excellent schools that continue to do a really great job. It's because of the businesses that we have here, our favorable tax ratings, our, you know, educational attainment level, and of course, the access to the metro parks that we have, and all of the work that we're doing to make Solon more walkable and bikeable and just a, a healthy community, um, that is certainly not going unnoticed. So as long as, you know, we're, we're, we're doing things like supporting each other and just being a good community, we've got the safety forces, we're keeping it safe. Um, I'm certainly optimistic that we will continue to grow and attract businesses. And when you look at the next slide in terms of economic development, some big projects, we have the Hawthorne Housing Development big project that's... Um, in the works, Solon voters are gonna be asked on November 3rd to rezone the 32 acres next to Hawthorne Valley Country or Golf Club to allow for 105 single family homes for people 50 and older. It's gonna be nice. We're having a, you know, a place for empty nesters to go when they do wanna downsize. And uh, as part of the deed restriction to this development, there's gonna be 150 acres of the 204 acre property that's going to be preserved as beautiful green space here in Solon. And um, when talking about the homes, each single family home is going to have a two car attached garage, first floor master bedroom, and will be at least 1500 square feet. I believe that's my last slide. So I, don't, I did want to make sure that uh, 
I save time for our IT director, Jim Gibbs. All right, thanks, Angie. Um, all right, so from the technology perspective, uh, the city's had many of the same challenges that all of uh, you likely face in the private sector, like a new remote workforce, VPN connections, webcams, and of course the number one issue, uh, determining if we need to wear pants to our morning Zoom meetings. Um, so instead of rehashing all of that, uh, I thought I would uh, share with you some of the challenges we faced uh, specific to a public entity and uh, maybe even try and enlist one or two of you in our cause. Um, as of uh, April, we had the challenge of how to conduct public business without the public being allowed to attend our meetings. However, until about mid-April um, of 2020, uh, of course, the only entities in Ohio that could conduct public meetings via phone or video conference were port authorities. Uh, no other entity could have a public official vote in a public meeting remotely until special action was taken by the General Assembly. So this change, in my opinion, um, can bring about new opportunities for efficiencies and participation in our public meetings if the legislature can be convinced to make these changes permanent beyond their December 1st, 2020 expiration date. So that's task number one. Now, uh, task number two, along those same lines, uh, only recently have we been able to have public bids for our projects through uh, some creative use of our outdoor pavilions at our golf course in various areas. So Ohio law makes it uh, challenging to award projects that are submitted online via an online bid portal. Uh, so that's the kind of the issue too that I'm going to talk that I uh, just wanted to share with you today. Uh, so if any of you out there have connections in the Ohio General Assembly, <laughs> I'd love to enlist you in our cause so we can continue to work as efficiently as possible on your behalf. Um, so now I'll get down from my soapbox for a moment, and I wanted to touch on the state of broadband in, in, uh, in Solon. Uh, we've been having meetings with AT&T, Spectrum, Verizon uh, to discuss various challenges in the broadband capabilities for our residents. Uh, while I understand that that may not directly impact the, the people on this call. I imagine it indirectly affects you through your remote workers and their ability to maintain stable remote connections. So we're hopeful that these conversations will escalate Solon uh, on the priority list for new fiber and 5G installs in the coming years. Uh, as far as the business community is uh, concerned, we've generally found that you are much better served with connectivity options than uh, residents are, but if you are having problems, which we know it's not perfect to everyone, uh, or would simply like to get other options for your internet service, uh, give me a call at the city and I can share with you the resources we have uh, for, for um, alternate providers for you. So, and then uh, finally, the uh, two other developments over the last six months uh, involve the uh, city website and our permitting process, as the mayor had alluded to earlier. Um, we recently gave uh, we recently uh, gave our city website a facelift uh, to comply with our new branding guidelines that Angie and, and her team worked very hard on. Uh, so it can be easier to navigate and uh, more mobile device friendly. So check it out as you have the address there on the slide. And then uh, we also launched our new permitting software called EnterGov. And I'm hopeful uh, that we can open the web portal for online permitting by the end of the summer. And other than that, uh, I'll wrap up our part of the presentation, the slide deck anyway, and uh, turn this back over to Mr. Bennett for any questions. Thanks, Jim. Uh, and thank you, Matt, Angie, uh, and Mayor Krause. Uh, super informative and great to get uh, you know, an update on where things stand and, and where things might look in the, in the future. I do have... Uh, Several questions I'm going to try and, uh, uh, you know, get to before uh, 10 a.m. Uh, so the first one, uh, and I'm not sure if this is, uh, you know, a Matt question or Mayor Krause uh, question, is uh, with so many people working from home uh, and so much of our revenue based uh, in Solon on, on withholding an income tax on place of work, um, you know, what's, how big of a concern are, are we right now as, as workforce may continue to work home for an extended period of time? Uh, and if the, if the way the state law is written, it's place where the work was done versus uh, the home office.
Uh, Mayor, do you want me to take that? He's probably saying yes. Okay. Yeah, so right now, back in March, the State General Assembly um, did change the withholding provision in, the, in Chapter 718, which is the Municipal Income Tax Chapter, that all cities have to, have to conform to with their, on their local um, income tax measures. Uh, they did provide the flexibility for employees working from home to, in a sense, throw back their payroll withholding to the headquarters city. So it, it, take a basic example, if it's an employee that works for Nestle and they're working from home, um, even though they're not working out of Nestle headquarters, the, the withholding that's attributable to that employee would fall back to the headquarters city, which is Solon. So we're operating under that premise for the, at least the intent of the law was to operate under that premise uh, through the emergency declaration plus 30 days. So we don't, there's uncertainty as far as when that will end. Right now we're still in a state of emergency, so it seems like for the foreseeable future, you know, we have that benefit, or at least communities have that benefit until it's challenged. And it has been officially challenged. I know there was a suit filed last week um, by a, a think tank um, that's more conservative, well, it's very conservative leaning in its, in its approach, but it was bound to happen. If it wouldn't have been them, it would have been somebody else. So they're, they're challenging that, that provision. Now, again, that was a law change. So I don't know legally what type of standing they'll have or how difficult it will be to make the case to uh, the court that that provision is not constitutional or not compliant with uh, Chapter 718 of Revised Code. So for now, we're in a sense in a holding pattern like all the other communities. Now, if, if that provision were to be overturned, what does that mean for the city of Solon? Not quite clear, but I think we're one of the cities that would probably be in the range of it may help us a little bit or it may hurt us a little bit. Just because we think we, 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 think we have an understanding that uh, just as people are working from home, they, they're employed by companies headquartered in Solon working from home, uh, we also think there are people that work for companies in downtown Cleveland or other places that are working from home in Solon as well. So there would be an offset. The question is, does it offset us to the positive? Is it a slight um, loss in revenue? We don't know yet. We are a read a member community. So if it becomes more apparent that this provision may be overturned, uh, we would work with Rita and other member cities of Rita to determine a potential, um, in a sense, a, sen a sensitivity analysis. How would it impact the city of Solon in terms of revenue loss or gain? <clears throat> the, the one thing that could be a little more taxing on us <clears throat> would be the need to uh, refund employees if they were if the, that provision were to be found um, not lawful, even though it was approved by the General Assembly. You know, there, there'd be a need to potentially refund dollars on top of the shift in how the withholding is attributable to um, the place of work. So that's that's what we know right now. And I, and I would just add that um, we're going to work um, very closely with uh, Rep. Uh, Phil Robinson, who's our rep, and uh, State Senator Matt Dolan uh, regarding uh, how best to approach it from, from our community. And also, we have great partners with the Mayors and Managers Association. So there are a lot of uh, other communities like-minded uh, that we're going to partner with to figure out what's the best solution long-term uh, for the city. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. Um, so quick question, is there uh, any update that can be provided on uh, the noise barriers that are, are going up on 422 or are scheduled to go up on 422? Yeah, the only update is um, we are uh, in the midst of the process. There's a petitioning process that you have, you have to go through. Uh, you have to get signatures um, from certain uh, groups that are abutting uh, the barriers. So um, it's a little difficult going door to door um, with, uh, with COVID. Uh, so we're trying to figure out how you're able to do that um, virtually, uh, be able to have an online process where people can uh, express their views, you know, sign up, uh, and then you have to take that to um, ODOT. So we're in the, in the middle of that process. Awesome, I'm gonna try and get two last questions in and then uh, 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 we'll, we'll go from there. So. Uh, Next question uh, is uh, one of the folks on the call today has a, you know, a $500 community fund um, and just uh, any recommendations on how best to use those resources or connect those resources from a city perspective. Where is, where is money most needed right now to, to help the community? Well, I mean, there's, you know, we have the uh, Solon Foundation, uh, which is um, our uh, city foundation. Um, we have a, a great 
organization, the Solon Benevolent Fund. Uh, that's a, a local organization that usually helps um, those most in need. Um, we have a great uh, Rotary Club uh, that does uh, such great projects um, worldwide, nationally, and, and, and locally. Uh, so those, I'd probably say the three uh, areas. Um, we obviously uh, are always looking for, for help and assistance, Our, you know, safety forces, uh, you know, obviously need all that the help and assistance with, you know, various things. Our, you know, senior center is always looking at, you know, those type of opportunities. So um, I, I think those are probably the avenues uh, that would best be received. Okay. And then last question. Here we go. Someone was picking up food at a stolen restaurant. Uh, employee, the employees at the restaurant had no masks. Uh, so I know that you can call, uh, you know, county hotline for, uh, you know, reporting any violations. Is there any local resource, uh, you know, within Solon, um, you know, that somebody can, uh, you know, call uh, to, to report or, or, you know, or let it be known because uh, uh, we know the county hotline, you know, receives tens of thousands of calls. Um, and we know that this really is not a, a police enforcement, uh, you know, issue. So uh, any, any local uh, resource on that outside of the county, uh, Hotline. Sure. I mean, you know, the, you, you can always call the mayor's office. I'm sure if it's a business, you can call Angie. Uh, but you have to understand, you know, the enforcement uh, mechanism uh, is the County Board of Health. Uh, and actually, you know, the, the county just sent out uh, violation notices um, to several Solon businesses. So um, uh, they're taking action. Uh, the, the, the process is you report it to the Board of Health. Uh, the county then sends out notices, um, and they do follow up with that. So um, uh, many businesses have already received uh, notices of violations. Uh, so, but you can always obviously call us. Uh, myself or Angie would be willing. And and we, you know, obviously Angie talks to businesses daily. Uh, so uh, we've done that before, where we've contacted a business uh, just as a courtesy and a heads up uh, as to you know what, what what's going on within their store or their business. Yeah, and, and really, I, you know, there certainly have been some notifications. I've received a couple calls and work closely with Chief Tonelli, too, and he's, he's extremely supportive and um, responsive as well. Uh, but we have found when we call the businesses, usually there's a misunderstanding or it might be one employee or something, and then they, they usually take care of it. I think Solon has been pretty good overall of being cooperative with the mask mandate. And I think just in, in, in closing to that, just so, you know, uh, you know, folks that, you know, that asked the question or what have you, um, this is not a police enforcement piece. This is a board of health uh, directive at this point. So, um, you know, if a police officer sees somebody without a mask, uh, you know, is in that restaurant, it's really about department of health uh, and us as a, a citizen to report that violation, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, if it becomes a, a, a larger issue where it's a trespass, where if, the, if they're asked to leave and they don't leave uh, because they don't have a mask, then it's a different issue. Then it becomes uh, criminal in nature, which is, you know, a trespass violation. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you know, love ending on a, on a mask, no mask uh, piece, because that's not <laughs> polarizing at all. Um, and, uh, you know, but thank you to everybody at the city uh, and, and folks, uh, you know, from across the state that joined us, uh, you know, representing different areas of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the state and, and, you know, U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, so thankful for our partnership with the city. Uh, continue to work on, uh, you know, on the phases of this, of reopening, rebounding, recovering, uh, and growing all, all in the lens of, uh, you know, of, of safety and safely. So look forward to seeing, uh, you know, many of you on future uh, calls, programs, uh, et cetera, uh, and look forward to, you know, seeing uh, you know, everyone here in person when appropriate uh, and, and have a great day and stay safe. And uh, thank you again, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.